If there's one word at the heart of Metal Gear Solid's existence, it's betrayal. None, perhaps, can compare to the misdirection that it weaponizes against the player ourselves. In this penultimate entry in MGS1's retrospective essay series, Existence, we'll discuss the likeliest purposes behind the legendary game's many meta betrayals, why they make it so captivating, and ultimately, how it all coincides with the game's wider themes. Just as the boss said, it is my existence which is no longer needed in this world. But my body will not remain in this place. My spirit and my flesh will become one with the ravens. In that way, I will return to Mother Earth who bore me. Nate! I will be watching you, understand? Snake, take this security card. It will open that door. Why? You are a snake which was not created by nature. You and the boss. You are from another world. A world that I do not wish to know. Go and do battle with him. I will be watching from above. First, I'll give you a hint. The man who you saw die before your eyes. What is it? Why? That was not the Dharma Chief. It was Decoy Octopus, a member of Foxhound. From its very first scenes, Metal Gear Solid is lying to us. The teaser cinematic that plays upon booting the game drips with techno spy thriller magic, but is it really a genuine portrait of what's to follow? In fact, much of it, both visually and premise-wise, is a recreation of aspects from two different Sean Connery movies, made before MGS1 in the 1990s. The Hunt for Red October and The Rock. His name is John Mason, British national incarcerated on Alcatraz in 1962, escaped in 63. There's no identity in the United States or Great Britain. He does not exist. Snake, there's enough dirt in your file from your days as an agent to keep you in the stockade until you're a very old man. No, this isn't a counterfeit. It's intentionally plastic, purely as a setup. To see how, turn to the briefing. But we've got a serious situation here. Only you can get us out of it. Throughout this half hour of optional story content, our betrayal by MGS1 is on full display, if not hiding in plain sight. On first blush, we are led to believe that Snake is a real-life action hero, that Colonel is a real Colonel, and that Dr. Naomi Hunter is a cookie-cutter, sexist ideal of woman as helpmate brought to life. I guess I can call you when I'm ready to go on a diet. You're welcome. We're also tricked to think that the game takes place on a nuclear disposal facility, when in fact it takes place on a weapons development facility. We're told falsely also that terrorists attacked the compound and seized control of a nuclear weapon there. Notice that though Campbell doesn't explicitly connect these dots for us, any reasonable and perceptive player is likely here to infer that terrorist nuclear payload was among the decommissioned warheads on site. They even gave us the serial number of the warhead they plan to use. Was the number confirmed? I'm afraid so. And they're certainly not going to guess that the terrorists were in fact the staff of this facility, in charge of maintaining operational security for a private arms developer, not the US government. Then Campbell in the briefing says, oh so coincidentally, that among the only three people on the island who didn't join the insurrection happens to be his niece, Merrill. Colonel, you're retired. Why are you involved in this? Because there aren't many people who know Foxhound as well as I do. Is that really the only reason? I've been soldiering for a long time. I don't know anything else. I guess even though I'm getting a little old, I still love to be in the field. Colonel, you're a lousy liar. 
Tell me the real reason. Okay, Snake. Sorry. I'll be frank. A person very dear to me is being held hostage. Who is it? My niece, Meryl. Her presence notice is what stirs Snake to act. He begins the operation thinking it's purely an unofficial ad hoc mission, one he's willingly embarked on just to help out one of his oldest and only so-called friends. But just as delusionally, Snake also thinks that Dr. Naomi's on his side, and that the only reason Campbell is being so forceful is because he's worried about his relative, Merrill. What's crucial here is how the two former members of Foxhound, Naomi and Campbell, sell Snake the world they wish he'd see. It's with a Trojan horse, disguised as next-gen secret technology, that they do so. Naomi's injection does more than enable Snake to conduct an arctic amphibious infiltration. It also poisons Snake with the venom that she calls fox dye. Snake, it's about Naomi Hunter. Then you should talk to the Colonel. He's looking into it. Turn your monitor off. Okay, it's off. No one else can hear us. Go ahead. Sorry, but I didn't want the Colonel to hear. Okay, so what's up? I've got a good friend in the Pentagon. Yeah? He's the one who told me about it. It looks like the DIA recently developed a new type of assassination weapon. An assassination weapon? Snake, have you ever heard of something called Fox Dye? No. Fox Dye. Liquid and the others were talking about it. Yeah. It's some kind of virus that, that targets specific people. I don't know all the details, but... What are you trying to say? It's too similar. What is? The cause of death. Didn't the arms tech president and the DARPA chief, I mean, decoy octopus, die of something that looked like a heart attack? Yeah. Well, apparently, Fox Die kills its victims by simulating a heart attack. Fox Die, which is not revealed until very late in the game, is at the core of explaining why Snake is no true action hero. In reality, in the world of MGS, there are no more heroes. They aren't allowed, lest they transform into a potential rival like Liquid Snake. Snake's actual value is mostly as a disease vector, pure and simple, much like the rats during the Black Plague. In other words, it is then, once you've been given her shot, that you and Snake simultaneously become a version of a Trojan horse yourselves. Fox Die kills based on encountering a pre-programmed target's discrete genomic ID. This in turn is exactly like the PAL system, which de facto locks out the so-called wrong types of people, and by logical extension keeps the so-called right ones out of harm's way, and in quote-unquote control over these weapons of mass destruction. But if Snake and the player become a Trojan horse together, who's the target? Liquid Snake, of course. To grasp all this, it's key I tell you up front that there is a triple agent, Mole, in our midst, Revolver Ocelot. As we'll see, evidence exists suggesting the events of MGS-1 are something of an experiment decades in the making. The many double crosses, ruses, and misdirects are difficult to track, but at bottom it all goes back, in a way, to the briefing. As Naomi and the Colonel explain, the US Army is looking for how to create the perfect soldier without the normal requisite experience. The military has been working towards identifying those genes which are responsible for making effective soldiers. There are genes that do that? Yes. And using gene therapy, they're able to transplant those genes into regular soldiers. Yes, we could. But it all depends on being able to isolate and identify those soldier genes. And in order to do that, it's helpful if you can study the genomic information of one of the greatest soldiers ever. The man they call the greatest warrior of the 20th century. You don't mean Big Boss. That's right. We've been working feverishly to identify the genes responsible for his incredible combat skill. So far, we've discovered about 60 of the so-called soldier genes. So his body was recovered after all. But here's what they conveniently leave out of this picture. All that they have are DNA samples of Big Boss, the greatest soldier of the 20th century. They have, in other words, only the raw materials to artifice a new Big Boss genetically. This begs an all too obvious question that the events of the game seem posed to put into practice. Does it mean they already have what's needed to recreate Big Boss's will, his determination, his spirit? 
just by having his DNA? Or would creating another big boss require something more than genes alone? What is the role, in other words, of nurture in tandem with nature? Now you're worse. Compared to you, I'm not so bad. The key changed shape. Hurry to the control room. That's the last key. Master, I've never heard you so excited. Snake, can you hear me? It's Naomi. Naomi? What the hell? Campbell and the others are busy right now. I'm on a different codec. Naomi, is what the Colonel says true? Yes, but not everything I said was a lie. Who are you? I don't know myself. I don't know my real name or even what my parents looked like. I bought all my identification, but my reason for getting into genetics was true. Because you want to know yourself, right? That's right. I want to know where I came from, my, my age, my race, anything. Naomi. I, I was found in Rhodesia sometime in the 80s, a dirty little orphan. Rhodesia? What's now known as Zimbabwe? Yes. Rhodesia was owned by England until 1965, and there were lots of Indian laborers around. That's probably where I got my skin color from, but I'm not even sure about that. Naomi, you're too worried about the past. Isn't it enough to understand who you are now? Understand who I am now? Why should I? No one else tries to understand me. I was alone for so long, until I met my big brother, and him. Your big brother? Yes. Frank Yeager. What? He was a young soldier. When he picked me up near the Zambezi River. I was half dead from starvation and he shared his rations with me. Yes. Frank Yeager. The man who you destroyed was my brother and my only family. No. Grey Fox? We survived that hell together, Frank and I. He protected me. He's my one connection. The only connection I have to my past. And he brought you back to America? No. I was in Mozambique when he came. Who is he? You mean Big Boss? Yes. He brought us to this land of freedom. This America. Then he and my brother went back to Africa to continue the war. And that's when it happened. You killed my benefactor and sent my brother home a cripple. I vowed revenge and joined Foxhound. I knew it was my best chance to meet you and I prayed for the day that I would. So were your prayers answered? With Fox Die, the extermination of every major player on Shadow Moses becomes sort of automated and so guaranteed. There's no real need for a big boss type here, as we see with Snake. Yet they all still pretend. Why? Because that, I'd argue, is the real experiment. The ruse itself, the illusion that's maintained for you even as it's shifting and breaking down throughout the game. Can the heroic mentality necessary to win against all odds be artificially induced? Could this be the true purpose of the Shadow Moses incident? Which of the two varieties of Big Boss, solid or liquid, will prove more determined in the end? And once unleashed, can one of these beautiful monsters counteract the other? Of course, the major difference between them is that Liquid's conditions influence a delusion of autonomy, whereas Snake's are always emphasizing a complete lack of control. Of course, ironically, the way that these are posed through rhetoric is inverted. Liquid seems to think that he has none of the control, whereas Snake is allowed to feel as if he's the hero. But if you look closely, that couldn't be further from the truth. This is naturally necessary for leading Liquid into villainy and his twin into a dog-like servitude. What? We've got a spy working in the Pentagon. He reported that Dr. Hunter altered Fox Dye's program just before the operation, but no one knows how or why. I 
wonder. Maybe they arrested her so they could find out the answer to that. No doubt. But I had no idea she was motivated by such petty revenge. We still don't know what changes she made to Fox Dye's program. Oh well, it doesn't matter. I've already added the Fox Dye vaccine to my list of White House demands. There's a vaccine? There must be. But that woman is the only one who really knows. Anyway, it might prove to be unnecessary. Why is that? You were successful in coming into contact with all of us, so we must have all been exposed to the virus. It's true that the Armstead President and Decoy Octopus were killed by Fox Dye, but Ocelot, myself, and you, the Carrier, were apparently unaffected. A bug in the virus's programming? Hmm. Could be. In any case, if it doesn't kill you, then I'm not worried either. After all, our genetic code is identical. So it's true. You and I are... Yes, twins. But we're not ordinary twins. We're twins linked by cursed genes. Les enfants terribles. You're fine. You got all the old man's dominant genes. I got the flawed recessive genes. Everything was done so that you would be the greatest of his children. The only reason I exist is so they could create you. I was the favorite, huh? That's right. I'm just the leftovers of what they used to make you. Can you understand what it's like to know that you're garbage since the day you were born? But I'm the one Father chose. So that's why you're so obsessed with Big Boss. Some warped kind of love. Love? It's hate! He always told me I was inferior, and now I'll have my revenge! <laughs> you should understand me, brother. You killed our father with your own hands! You stole my chance for revenge! Now I'll finish the work that father began. I will surpass him! I will destroy him! You're just like Naomi. Well, I'm not like you! Unlike you, I'm proud of the destiny that is encoded into my very genes! Yeah! Snake! Your blood will be the first to be spilled by this glorious new weapon! Consider it an honor, a gift from your brother! Now I'll show you! The power of the weapon that will lead us in the 21st century! It's moving. <laughs> As Liquid says, stopping the launch and rescuing the hostages, it was all just a diversion." End quote. They, the secret, nameless, formless entity behind the game's events, ensure that Liquid becomes the stereotypical bad guy in many ways, including via the influence played by their triple agent, Revolver Ocelot, in giving him a lifelong inferiority complex. Ocelot tells Foxhound about Fox Die in advance but he also kills the DARPA chief, disguising it as an accident. This single-handedly extinguishes the terrorists' nuclear threats, setting the stage for the experiment to come. Only if Foxhound can learn the chief's portion of the launch code can their attack go on as scheduled. Improvising on the spot, Liquid snatches the identity of the real McDonnell Miller by murdering him. Then he sends Foxhound's specialist decoy octopus wearing the visage of Donald Anderson to interrogate Snake as a cutout. Notice what this means? Ironically, both versions of Foxhound, the one with Colonel and Naomi, and the one led by Liquid Snake, tacitly work to trick you and Snake together. This is part of what makes MGS1 so great from a game design perspective, the confluence of narrative and game design. However, yet again, Liquid's betrayed by their inside man. Ocelot neglects to mention that not even a complete blood transfusion will keep Octopus Anderson safe. That's because of the biggest betrayal by MGS1 yet. 
the VIPs, Anderson and Baker, are in fact marked for death, not rescue, by the powers that be. Anderson's DNA, as well as Octopus's, has been programmed for destruction via fox dye. So obviously neither Foxhound was going to learn diddly squat from the staged debriefing we experience at the earliest part of the game in the cell between Snake and Octopus Anderson. Octopus's true purpose for Ocelot is mostly to keep up the right appearances, the ruse, while directing Snake to Ocelot and the Armstech president on the floor below. The grand experiment behind the scenes that I'm claiming exists is made clear by the bizarre way that Ocelot lures Snake into a duel not to kill him but purely to test his abilities. Ocelot knows beforehand about the appearance of Grey Fox, it seems, but what the Pentagon don't realize until later is that just before the mission, Naomi, spurned on by her secret relationship with Grey Fox, made alterations to the virus. Liquid already knew about Fox well before he makes his appearance and was simply biding his time for the inevitable confrontation. But whatever the case, it seems Ocelot sacrificed his own hand simply to give his true objectives more cover. Keeping Snake busy in a solitary location effectively used him as Grey Fox bait, playing the two against each other. This in turn is crucial for the wider experiment, which involves confronting Snake with the past, to trick him nostalgically into mixing up then and now, emotionally speaking or psychologically speaking. Doing so ensures a veneer of reality in Snake's mind, as well as the players, whether or not they played the earlier games. Someone somewhere, likely Ocelot via the proxy of Naomi, if not Naomi herself, tips Fox off that Snake's third destination is Hal's lab. It's the perfect arena for the showdown that Fox has been living to recreate, making it impossible for him to resist, and also making him a perfect decoy. The terrorists send Psycho Mantis afterwards to probe Snake's mind for the missing half of the launch code, but contact with his mind gives Mantis such a strongly negative psychic reaction, he's incensed into combat. As he lays dying, Mantis tries to redeem himself by luring Snake into Sniper Wolf's path, convinced Snake is an aberration in need of destroying. Mantis also seems to be wanting to make the point through the events to come to Snake about how Mantis became Mantis in the first place. The inexorable determinism of life, in other words. Liquid has Wolf only wound Meryl, meanwhile, to gain a bargaining chip as a plan B, or is it C, now that Mantis was dead. The great psychic was in effect sacrificed to give everything an element of realism, much like Ocelot's hand. Not even Mantis may have seen that coming, however. Like much of what I'm saying, who can really say for sure? All this is just my best educated guess. Ocelot allows Snake to escape from the cell, while yet again cloaking the true extent of his power and strength of his intelligence with a transparent bomb ruse sure to be found out. In truth, this bomb is Ocelot hinting to us and Snake the existence of Fox Die. Liquid is willing to sacrifice his best men and even risk his own life flying in the hind because he doesn't want to fight Snake before toughening him up into a suitable surrogate for the one that Liquid truly wants to fight but never will be able to thanks to Snake, his father. We see Liquid's devious scheme to make Snake more like him is working when Snake uses the saying about flies right before taking Liquid on in the hind. The war in Afghanistan made the stinger and the hind famous. It was a foregone conclusion that Snake would most likely win this fight, and also that Liquid would survive, given he employs a parachute at the right time, leaving it for Snake to find as yet another message. But Snake's final test of strength is a real fight against Raven, who holds nothing back this time, unlike the first encounter in the tank, while secretly knowing all along he's most likely going to die. It's all not just to get Snake to a big boss level of power, but much more importantly to trick him into activating the nuke. Once this is complete, Liquid reveals himself, but not before, still as Miller, having exposed Naomi in a huge diversion, ruse, and double cross. What not even Liquid knows, though, is much of what he's been told throughout not only the mission but his entire life by Ocelot and others who are associated with the nameless, shapeless entity behind the events of the series was only half true. Nor does Liquid realize that Ocelot has set him up to fail, 
all in order to carry out the real psychology experiment of Shadow Moses while neutralizing the threat of Metal Gear Rex. That was Ocelot's assignment. Except Ocelot's masters in Washington or elsewhere don't realize all he's really after is a plausibly deniable method of obtaining Rex's specs to leak onto the black market, which sets into motion the events of the next game, Metal Gear Solid 2 Sons of Liberty. So all in all, MGS1 has really a rather twisting and purposefully convoluted storyline full of ambiguities, backstabs, and betrayal. And as we'll see, the same duplicitousness extends down into the fundamentals of its core game design, too. The level design, from the caverns to the nuclear warhead storage building, works as the narrative's accomplice. What I mean is that MGS1 is an incredibly detailed game, but these details do not necessarily convey truth. Rather, they convey appearances, and sometimes those appearances are meant to deceive. Little touches like the snowy vents on your SVD and the intricate pulley system we see in the cavern underground all work to not only sell us the realism of the game, but also sell us its fiction. For Snake, the player is left with a bizarre sense of being inside Snake's state of mind. He's playing a game too. We both on some level want that game to never be over, to be real. Snake wants redemption, just as the player wants to beat the game. In Snake's case, what's interesting is he himself becomes a sort of character in this game within the game. We see him gradually rise to the occasion, becoming a new identity, propped up by the half-true self his puppet masters want him to see, while ignoring the other half. And it's Merrill's near martyrdom that incenses Snake's spirit, giving him the sense that this mission is finally his chance to overcome his own inner demons. However, what's crucial is how, from the prison break to the activation of Rex's nuke, we start to see more and more of the snake that he wants to forget, and then gradually begins to full-blown just accept about himself, thereby becoming both more powerful and more ruthless. He's unintentionally cruel to Otacon, for example, while being completely unfazed by what he thinks to be an act of fratricide when he downs Liquid's hind. In short, Snake gets tricked into believing the self is something that you can just choose. He chooses to only see the heroism of his actions. Ironically, it's this narcissism that allows Snake to unconsciously become more of a pawn for the villains. The two biggest gameplay betrayals, I'd argue, both happen near the end of MGS1. The first would be the lengthy and ornate PAL backtracking card activation sequence. Second would be Liquid's testament of revelation, if you will. Though the latter is strictly a cutscene, it has retroactive effects on your entire experience so far, while also impacting the experience of the final boss fight against Liquid himself. The reveal that the, all the genome soldiers have shared your DNA is one of, arguably, the biggest subversive twists in all of gaming history. In closing, the purpose of MGS1's deceptions are twofold. One is political, the other, if you will, ludical. Politically, the game's ruses draw attention to how the status quo uses free will against itself and pits the narratives of hero versus villain to obfuscate what is in fact the ruthless and amoral nature of geopolitics. Ludically, making the game so resplendent with misdirects and red herrings and unanswerable questions such as the ones that we have briefly tried, probably in vain, to answer here, means everyone who plays MGS1 has something like a version of their very own, a reflection of their own existence. A world where warriors like us are honored as we once were, as we should be. That was Big Boss's fantasy. It was his dying wish. 